episode, Triangle of Terror. GearWebsites.com is your source for firearms-based playing cards and books. We also have mugs, shirts, and posters with designs that we've made live. Of course, we have patches. Every Friday is Free Patch Friday. We appreciate your support. Thank you for shopping at GearWebsites.com. It's 11.59 at Radio Free America, and this is Uncle Sam with Music and the Truth Until Dawn. Right now, I've got a few words for some of our brothers and sisters in the occupied zone. The chair is against the wall. The chair is against the wall. John has a long mustache. John has a long mustache. It's 12 o'clock, Americans, another day closer to victory. And for all of you out there on or behind the lines, this is your song. Good evening, good morning, or whenever you happen to watch this. We're taking a look at a preview of the project we're working on. So in the beginning of this whole thing, you've seen this dude do this, and then you've seen this. Does it keep saying stuff while I'm doing this? I think it does. So these are the Patreons, the people that support what we do. They subscribe to our projects over on a Patreon platform. These are the people paying a couple of bucks. These are the people paying something like $3 for a cup of coffee each month. That provides our Minuteman University project specifically. Thank you for that. That keeps the servers going every once in a while. The software, not very often, mostly just the servers. A bunch of people pay us about as much as a order, like something to eat for lunch. So basically they buy us lunch each month. When they do that, it adds up. And that's how we're able to do the projects like we're talking about tonight. Our Second Amendment history projects where we look back at where we came from and how we got here and then we've got some patrons that make it possible for us to do our work in the community with the uh, gun channels project we've got the daily gun show which is supported by a group of patrons as well and then finally the patrons doing the most and giving the most resources to the projects are thanked as well so uh just wanted to mention that we don't uh put those up there well, we have them up there for lots of reasons. One, you can't put them all on one screen and still be able to read them. But also, they're all at a different level. And that's how we uh, divvy it up. They're helping pay for the various projects, support the various projects out there. So when we're talking about our Second Amendment, uh, we're talking about our Second Amendment history, I guess. One of the things that's involved is the guns, right? Well, some guns you can own, some guns you can't own because of stupid laws or because they're just not available. There's not a lot of them. They're rare. Uh, they're unique. They're crazy difficult to get a hold of or whatever maybe they're just gone from time right time passes on or whatever so uh not everything is available out there but uh, another issue is that they're just big like if you tried to get every ak-47 which some of us had the inclination to do at some point in the past um it's very difficult you need to have a giant safe for that you have to have a lot of money i guess does it still work uh, you have to have a lot of money and how do you display them i've seen some excellent efforts at displaying a lot of rifles uh, but you really need a big facility to do that and it becomes expensive and costly to secure that facility as well so what do you do well some people decide to settle for other accessories or parts of the firearm and uh, one of the ways to explore a collection of kalashnikov uh, firearms would be their bayonets the accessory that's got the most in my opinion the most oh what's the word like design qualities or essence of the rifles in other words you could also collect their magazines you could collect their web gear their pouches or their belts or their straps and stuff like that uh, there's some canteens and other mm, kit that people might wear there's uniforms Right. The, there's a lot of variety of uniforms in a lot of countries and, you know, uniforms. There's ammunition, which is what I'm going to start collecting. And I've been collecting for a while now. But then the bayonets are unique in that they have the style of the rifle. They have the, the every bit of interesting material or design quality or intent is involved in the bayonets just as much as it is in the various rifles. So what are we even talking about here? One of the pictures I still have to add is like a comparative chart of the Kalashnikovs, the rifles we're talking about, because this is the bayonets for rifles, right? 
So I'll have some sort of an introduction here somewhere with some pictures, but what we're talking about is the AK-47, and then later the AKM, the modern AK-47 that most people are familiar with. The AK-47s are actually only around for a little while, so most things that we're used to are the AKM. After a while, they changed the caliber up, and then it became the AK-74. And then over time, somewhere in the 90s, 2000s, they've just evolved that platform. And they're still AK-74s, but they call them the Century Series, essentially. So that's the brief description of the rifles we're talking about. So each rifle has its own bayonet, and then each country that made the rifle pretty much has their own bayonet. So there's lots and lots of bayonets. There's lots of varieties in the rifles. Now, I'm not saying there's not, there are also a lot of varieties in the magazines and in the web gear and in the uniforms and in the ammunition and everything. But the bayonets are unique in that they can be displayed. They're interesting. They're still cool because they're a bayonet. They're not just a piece of bullet or a piece of strap or sling or something. Although I get, a, I understand why people collect slings. There's a lot of variety and in, in interesting aspects to each of these elements of the communist stuff. Um, so I've described a little bit the bayonet and what the rifle is we're talking about, but why would we care? There's a lot of rifles out there and there's a lot of bayonets for them. The AK bayonet, or the AK-47s, I should say, um, are unique because they were built during the Cold War to kill us. Those capitalists, the people that had uh, both, you know, we both together won World War II from fascists and had two different opinions on how to deal with the rest of the world and the communism you know had an intent to uh take their system and kind of push it on other countries we sold it to other countries or bought it from other countries or whatever and you know there's advantages and disadvantages to each but the communists took their rifle which they figured was so good which it's all right right and they pushed it onto germany they pushed it onto bulgaria they pushed it onto china they pushed it onto yugoslavia they pushed it onto hungary they pushed it onto other countries right so then other countries said well if they're doing this there must be something to it so some countries just adopted it not very many and each of those countries that got it pushed on them either accepted it lovingly cherished it or hated it czechoslovakians right so what you've got in the rifles is the cold war You've got uh, the aftermath of the World War II, which is sort of the evolution of firearms from uh, very crude and the beginnings of some of the designs and the very little evolution in the designs other to make them durable and reliable, sometimes reliable, mostly just durable, uh, and to be cheap to manufacture. And then you have the Cold War era where may, for firearms and all machines for that matter, but firearms are a good indicator of something that's critical, that's carried on an individual with sometimes very little training. So it has to be a machine that can deal with all elements, can be used easily, is dependable and reliable to be used immediately, and then it's going to be lethal when it's used reliable so that's a lot of effort that's like saying you want an electric drill to just work in any environment anytime it's very difficult to, to accomplish that in a drill let alone a firearm so it takes all that engineering and, and interest of the evolution of the gun but then throws the political stink on it of communism in the way that they were uh, mean to all their satellite countries so you've got a whole bunch of um that element to it then you get the element of the mechanics, not just building the thing, which is an element. You got the materials and you got the designs and you got how they're put together. But I guess I was thinking more of the archiving and the record keeping. Most of the countries had none. Some of the countries had immaculate, like down to each piece of the bayonet was tracked. And that element of it, again, is a, is a reflection or a, a con, what am I trying to say, like an extract of bigger 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 things so if you're interested in those elements or those pieces of the bigger picture history or uh, pieces of history these bayonets end up being just an interesting um, hold something you can hold in your hand something you can have the actual artifact and something that's affordable so now let's talk about uh, well i wanted to bring up still that uh, then you get the factories. So some of these are made in the same factories as the crank. Some of them are made in the same factories as Sega's, some which is the same factory. Some of them are made in the same factories that uh, the crank was developed at. 
which is a different place that doesn't even make guns, right? So there's all kinds of factories represented here that are different than the gun factories and the ammunition factories, but sometimes are the same factories. Uh, then you've got, um, I guess I was going to say, you've got the element that these things were not all that necessary. They're kind of the optics of the Cold War. These are designed to make good pictures, to scare people, uh, but they never really are used, hardly ever, and never really were intended to, I don't think, other than to be, you know, lethal looking in parades and to scare people and whatever. So, uh, and you wear it, you know, it has a, there's a, a look to that. So uh, the idea that these things weren't very valued, even by the people using them at the time, but certainly not afterwards. So they were inexpensive. They were often disregarded and collected, gathered, and, and accumulated as a nuisance and garbage more than anything. Um, the rifles had to be demilitarized or de, um, you know, demilitarized. They had to be uh, taken out of service. They had to have holes drilled in them, cut up, some kind of procedure so that they were no longer a firearm. Bayonets often don't have that quality, that issue. So where everything else, a lot of the weapons and the uh, more lethal stuff is going to be destroyed as part of whatever you know laws or infringements you got to deal with either in importing or exporting or in travel or in uh, local laws where they're going to be sold or whatever, uh, or just people being ignorant and doing defaulting to the worst tyranny instead of actually paying attention and doing the least amount possible. Anyway, so you got an issue with a lot of the stuff being demilitarized, uh, so it's kind of neutered. And then you've got the bayonets, which are still interesting and often untouched. Um, now, I guess I was also going to say that while they're disregarded and kind of able to be sold, they were also hardly ever tracked. So coming up with the history of these things and figuring it all out was ultimately interesting for many years for a whole bunch of us who were using all different kinds of resources as the internet was growing and as these things became more available and as more resources became more available to help us figure them all out and more people came on to the scene uh, to talk about them. So all kinds of reasons these things are of interest and uh, I guess getting back to the affordable, uh, some of them are super expensive. You know, the rarest ones, of course, can be expensive. Uh, not too many people are collecting these things as an investment. Some people did. And I'm sure they, some people should have made a bunch of money. I mean, seriously, some people should have made a bunch of money. Because just like a lot of relics, some of these things were pennies on the dollar. You know, very, very inexpensive for a while when they weren't in demand or they were the ugliest version or they had no use. And we'll take a look at some of those, I guess. But uh, and now they're worth something. So it is possible that people sat on piles of these or accidentally had hoarded these things unintentionally even and are making some money on them. But for the most part, even with that potential, we're not seeing uh, too many people uh, uh, invest these or sit on these things to invest them. Uh, we are seeing tons of people uh, buy one or two. And that's the other neat thing about them. Again, you got the AK-47, you got the 74, or excuse me, you got the 84, 747, you got the AKM, then you got the 74, and then the newest stuff. So it's definitely possible to get one of each of those bayonets and have a fairly complete collection with just four bayonets. And these things can be, well, I guess, I don't know, I haven't looked for prices in a while, but at the time, back in the day, you could get them for a buck or two. You can get them for $7, $20, $37, $100 $100 or less. So, uh, you know, you still find them at a garage sale. Some of you don't know what it is. Oftentimes, the Czechoslovakian ones, I think people think they're weird letter openers, and they're selling them for 7 bucks. So I've definitely seen them cheap. We'll see if they uh, continue to be cheap, especially now that there's a massive buyer's guide. So, uh, yeah, we're looking at the buyer's guide draft from uh, just hot off the printer. We just did an interview with Michael uh, Schwartz from Gun Owners Radio out of California. And uh, took this thing out of the printer and chopped it all up and turned it into a book to finally, after a million years worth of editing, to see what it's going to look like is as like an actual thing in 3D. Um, I don't know about anybody else, but when I'm trying to visualize this stuff, uh, it gets tough. After maybe 12 pages, it's pretty tough to figure out how big this thing's going to be and you know how far apart these two things are from each other. So what we're looking at is, um, you know, the intro there, some artwork. Uh, I like to get straight to it. 
I'm using the format from Amazon. So uh, unlike uh, normal, where I just start winging it, I use the Amazon format. So I used a little bit different format than I normally use. Uh, and then we go through a collector's guide. So first, why collect? Why would you even want to collect something like this? I guess first is a table of contents. Why collect these things? And then once you've decided to collect them, quick breakdown. Again, AK-47, AKM, AK-74. That's about it. Uh, so you've got a couple of maybe five different types of bayonets to keep track of. Maybe a couple of materials to keep track of. Maybe a couple of styles to keep track of. And then you're done. Or if you really want to dig in. So you could kind of stop here. You know, this is all you need to know. Or if you want to dig in a little bit more. You could find out that there is a little bit of depth to it. You change something here, you different size something over there, different color something, maybe something's made out of a different material. That's what will be recorded in these pages. So what we're looking at is your spikes that come out of China. You got your AK-47s, like I mentioned, the old ones. Then they start with the uh, first style of AKMs and then a later style of AKMs into your 74s. Every once in a while, there's exceptions to the rules, so there'll be a page about those. And uh, I'm still kind of experimenting. Like I say, this is a draft. We got the illustrations here, but then we've also got some photographs, and I kind of think I'm going to need to take new photographs. So the idea here is to collect some things that are, what, like examples, good examples of whatever the topic of the page happens to be. And I took these pictures before I created the buyers, uh, the collector's guide. So... Um, you know, kind of shuffling but these are placeholders to some extent and you know knowing i'll be taking some more pictures uh, these kind of show you where you know more pictures might be uh, once you get through the different types uh, of ak bayonet or kalashnikov bayonet i guess you get into the and then you got the exceptions right then you get into the crazy unique ones so no um collection would be complete without you know the exceptions to the rules so there's going to be your run of the mill, there's going to be your uncommons, and then there's going to be your very rares, right? So we got the very rares going on, and then the training. So another slice of the phenomenon is that you have to train with these things. And different countries came up with different ways to train with them, depending on if you're training with them as a knife, I guess, or a wire cutter, I guess, or as a uh, spear, right? So you can collect different ways, and when you're going to describe something that's got a lot of variety and a lot of um, depth to the different stuff, but at the same time, there's kind of a pretty basic way to conceptualize the whole thing. I tried to do that, kind of start with the basics, get into some of the first ways to think about it, kind of the first ways to comb through. So we talked about the different rifles and the times and whatever. So why are there a hundred on each page? Well, because this many countries made their own or this you know, countries made a couple or something. So when you get into that, you got to start thinking about, well, who made these things? Not just what were they for? So I'm going to have a page for each of the major countries. You got Russia, you got your China, or some people would say China. You've got your Germans. You've got your Bulgarians, you got your Polishes, you got your Hungarians. Then you get into some lesser ones where, I mean, I shouldn't say lesser. I'm still determining how many pages to put in here. Romanians really need their own page. <clears throat> yeah, that's just the fact. Uh, Egyptians don't, but could. Uh, Lithuanians, is that even a thing? You know, once you start getting into some of these, I'm going to have debates, I'm sure, with uh, collectors because... You know what I'm saying? Not everybody agrees which of the variants are which and that kind of stuff. So uh, then you've got some uh, other rarer ones, and then you get into guns that ain't even AKs anymore, but they're, I'm going to call them adjacent, like the CZ-75 or the VZ-75. All right, so then once you get through who made them, pretty stoked that right now China and Russia line up on the middle, but... I don't know if that matters too much, and I don't know if it'll stay that way. But uh, once you get through what to collect and where to collect it from, uh, I figured a collector's guide wouldn't be complete without talking about some different ways to collect because we got so many of these things. That's a picture of my collection. It was about 
three quarters of the way to be in full still. I don't really ever have a picture. I have a better picture, I guess, of it more full, but I don't really have a picture of it when it was totally complete. But uh, it's just too difficult to display them. But uh, there are different ways to collect and different ways to be completely satisfied and to, to get some real neat stuff without trying to just collect all of them. Problem is you can't just collect all of them anyway. There's really no end to some of them. There's a couple of different examples where there'll be like an infinitely num many number of materials used or something or weird variations to the grip or something. Uh, but then you can uh, collect some finite collections, some, some arrangements or some styles, ways of collecting. And uh, I'm also thinking what I'm going to include here is some methods of display. Uh, not just what you collect, but how you decide to present it, enjoy it, share it, and that kind of thing. Um, I haven't seen too many displays at museums and stuff, actually none, but, uh, you know, potentially uh, there could be something included there. Uh, I could probably add a couple more pages to it still, and uh, I'm still debating that. I don't think it really matters to the cost that much. It's just a matter of, you know, how the layout works and when it's too much, right? So with that, um, that's a uh, 20 minute something preview of it and a description of it. Uh, like I say, this is a draft, the first color draft. Uh, I don't know, this other draft I did, the second draft. Here's the first draft, which is straight out of Amazon and it's shitty, I didn't like it. So uh, after reformatting it and stuff, you, know, you can kind of see how it develops. So this isn't finished, but it's getting there. And then uh, it's given me some, uh, places to start putting these other elements of it that are missing at this point. So if you've got ideas on stuff to include, if you've got ideas on, uh, you know, things to uh, factor in or whatever, feel free. Uh, let us know in the comments. Uh, Patreons, as it says right here in the beginning of this thing. Thanks to the people who subscribe and support our efforts online and in print. Uh, it gives us time for projects like this one and their support makes this possible. So this is dedicated to our Patreons and a couple of folks in the uh, community who uh, got me started on collecting. But I'm um, still looking for some feedback on the form factor as well. These are drafts, so I don't think it's going to be this small. I don't see any reason why it would be this small. Uh, I don't know if it's worth making it large enough to make these things full size. In fact, I don't think it's worth that. Uh, I don't have one sitting next to me right now. But I have seen some of them where they were able to put full-size photos in there, and that's pretty neat. This isn't supposed to be a photo book. Those already exist. Oh, you know what? There's definitely going to be a couple more pages, so I guess this won't line up anymore because I totally forgot. I uh, put this together, got all antsy before I added the library at the end. So this is one of, you know, this will be the next of a line of Kalashnikov bayonet books. Martin Ivey, of course, my friend from Texas, wrote the first one in 2002. And then a couple of subsequent ones, uh, two Polish versions, a Russian version, two Russian versions, and Czechoslovakian version. There's a couple of other uh, books by now, I'm sure. But uh, this will be the next uh, English version, and it'll be um, on the backs of those others. So I'm not trying to redo anything. I'm just going to add to what the others have created. So I'm going to put a page two in the back here to thank the... Uh, writers and the uh, books that were published before this one. All right, so uh, you could do Western versions like the, what's a KCB 77? We'll take a look here. There's somebody in the U.S. making a bayonet. No, oh, that's from Italy, um, the Eclorin or whatever. I've got some adjacent stuff, but where do you draw a line on adjacent stuff? So if you want to find the adjacent stuff, you can go to the website. Um, but uh, yeah, I've got a couple. I would call. I'd put an M9 in there before I put that thing. Plus, that thing costs hundreds of dollars, and you can't buy them, so they're kind of pointless. They're great if you're in Europe. I don't know if you're in Europe. You probably can get them easier there. But uh, yeah, the adjacent ones and the commercial ones, I have a couple of commercial ones in here. Um, 
I only know of two people that ever owned one of those. So uh, there's an Italian version. This one's not Italian. I guess it's whatever, German or something. Or is it Italian? But anyway, there's another Italian one. That same thing. Like it's a $200 bayonet commercial. So I don't know. All right. Well, with that, then uh, appreciate the feedback. Middle of the night, 500 Magnum is out there. Thanks for joining. Um, I don't really care what time I posted this, so uh, appreciate the people that are up overnight uh, being part of it for the live part. Uh, if you're watching this in the morning because you don't feel like staying up all night for whatever reason, then uh, leave us some feedback. If you're a Patreon, of course, you're going to get one of these before anybody else. If you're in the uh, AK forum that I just uh, went back to, then definitely looking forward to your feedback uh, and any contributions you want to make to it, let me know. I'm looking forward to info pictures and are looking for info and pictures if you got them. Thanks for watching. Have a good night. I'll wrap it up with a link to our gear website store. Our Oh, shit. I should have put this down here a long time ago. Our Patreons, the people down here, make it possible for us to spend time on this. Like I said, they're the uh, ones the book is dedicated to. I wouldn't be able to take time out for something like this. It's obviously not important. It doesn't need to exist. On the other hand... I really think these are neat, and uh, I've spent a lot of time uh, researching them and uh, collecting the collection because they represent so much. So if I can share that element of it, and then with this booklet, uh, kind of share what it was like collecting them all. This first one will be Collector's Guide, the second version, if I am able to uh, put any more time into it after it's complete. It'll be more of uh, what it's like to collect. Uh, where I found some of them, some stories from some of the collected ones, uh, the origin story of the collection, and then some stories as it gets dissipated, because, you know, there's all kinds of stories from every angle on it. Uh, it's all about gun shows, hanging out, uh, meeting new people, and uh, archiving our history uh, for people today that are interested in it, and people tomorrow that may not, you know, get it from any place else. So again, thanks to our patrons for making it possible. Uh, we'll throw a link out here to our store where if you want to grab something, our other books are available over there. Uh, we've done the uh, Shooter's Almanac, which is essentially you know, a breakdown of uh, our Second Amendment history in a calendar type of format. We've done the uh, Passport Booklet for the uh, Firearms Museums. We've visited 33 of them so far and uh, include all the important ones into this Passport-like book. We've also got some playing cards and some other stuff over at the store. So thanks to the people that support our projects by purchasing stuff over at the store and joining us for conversations like this one. We'll be back to pick you up later. Gearwebsites.com is your source for firearms-based playing cards and books. We also have mugs, shirts, and posters with designs that we've made live. Of course, we have patches. Every Friday is free patch Friday. We appreciate your support. Thank you for shopping at gearwebsites.com. Episode Nobody Beats the House. Thank you for supporting our projects. If you'd like to buy us a cup of coffee, check out our Patreon channel. The guys and gals at gunwebsites.com encourage you to take a CCW class every year, practice at least once a month, and carry every day. Thank you for watching gunwebsites.com. Do, 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 do.